So shalom to everybody, good evening. As Tamar said, we are starting now a series of uh, four lectures in which we will uh, try to examine important uh, historical moments in the history of Zionism. Uh, in each uh, session, which I hope won't take more than 45 minutes or 50 minutes, we will read a poem or poems that uh, are considered uh, masterpieces in modern um, Hebrew poetry. And we will try to use these uh, texts as um, very powerful moments that reflect, reflect um, uh, deep changes in uh, Jewish history in the context of uh, Zionism. Today, in our first lecture, as a starting point for the, this entire short series, I would like to speak about the situation of uh, Russian Jewry in the middle of the 19th century, focusing on the poetry of uh, Yehuda Leib Gordon, better known as uh, Yalag. So let's uh, start with a short historical introduction just to get the wide context about the times we're speaking about. Um, the end of the 18th century began a new era in the lives of uh, Jews living in Eastern Europe um, because in the, later 17, uh, in the later 18th century, there was a process of the partition of Poland. Um, Poland was actually divided by three great empires that uh, surrounded it, Austria, Prussia and, Ru and the Russian Empire. And from that moment onwards, uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews suddenly uh, were part of uh, the Russian Empire and had to start living under the Russian rule, the Russia, Russian uh, regime. regime. Um, and for them, this was a completely new experience and uh, a meeting with a new cultural world. Now, from the Russian government's point of view, the Jews who were never allowed to live there before were quite a mystery. And through the entire 19th century, the Russian authorities examined various ways of, of uh, integrating the Jews into the Russian social and economic life. Now, these um, uh, ways were both uh, the difficult ones, sometimes actually quite brutal, trying to really force Jews to uh, become uh, actually Russians. Um, and some of them were a little more, more gentle, uh, trying to create new educational systems for Jews in the Russian Empire, teach them the language of the land, and in different ways, try and turn them into uh, productive subjects of the empire. So that was from the Russian point of view, the Russian government's point of view. As for the Jews, um, after many, many years, hundreds of years actually under um, the rule of the, the, the Polish, they also had to uh, try and understand how to live underneath uh, under Russian government and deal with all these changes that uh, the Russian govern government was trying to impose on them. Now, one of the most important movements inside Jewish life um, that tried to promote cooperation with the Russian government was uh, the movement of uh, Jewish enlightenment, which we call in Hebrew, uh, Haskalah. Haskalah movement in uh, East Europe in general and in uh, the Russian empire in particular wasn't a big one. Uh, no, no more than hundreds of, um, of people, maybe a, a thousand, but not more, much more than that. Basically, um, writers, poets, thinkers, teachers, that in different places, big cities and small towns and villages tried together to create a modern Jewish culture, both in Hebrew, Yiddish, and Russian. Uh, promoting the ideas uh, through books and newspapers, um, trying to um, bring into Jewish life the worlds of modern science, geography, history, literature, and poetry, and also calling for a serious change in the world of uh, Jewish education for children. 
So the Maskilim were not a large group, but still they had a very important influence on uh, Jewish society and Jewish culture through um, during the 19th century. And uh, as we might see in the next lectures, even far beyond that. So I won't be able to mention over here all the attempts made by uh, the Russian uh, uh, regime to promote so social and educational change in Jewish life during the first half of the 19th century and all the great conflicts that came with these um, attempts. I want to start our discussion in the, in the middle of the 1850s with the uh, beginning of the reign of the of Tsar Alexander II, the son of uh, Nicholas or Nikolai I, who ruled before him. So uh, this Tsar Alexander II played a very important role in uh, Russian history um, without be going beyond the context of Jewish history. Um, he tried to promote in the beginning of his uh, career as Tsar uh, quite serious reforms in uh, the Russian Empire. He's mainly remembered for the emancipation of Russian serfs in 1861, for which he's actually known as uh, Alexander the Liberator. And besides that move that was quite radical, he was uh, responsible for other reforms, including promoting local self-government, uh, creating a very large educational system, in, in, including university ed education, uh, setting up um, le elected local judges, and many other reforms he promoted. Now, all these uh, acts uh, by the Tsar were accept accepted by great enthusiasm amongst the Russian intellectuals and writers in general and also was uh, understood as a very important move uh, towards um, promoting the Jewish situation or dealing with the Jewish question in the Russian Empire. And so many Jewish masculine members of the Jewish uh, Enlighten Enlightenment movement were very thrilled and happy with these um, reforms created by the Tsar and his regime. And this uh, situation is the historical background for the work of Yehuda Leib Gordon, Yalag, and the poem he wrote uh, specific, specifically about these times and that we will uh, soon read. So read out aloud together. So let me say a, a few words about the poet and his life, and then we can read the poem and uh, try to say a few uh, things about it, trying to explain what deep meaning it has in uh, modern Jewish history and, what, uh, and how it reflects in a very profound way um, Jewish life at the time. So first of all, a few words about uh, Yalad himself. He was born in 1830. He received a religious education, but um, became a secular Jew as an adult. He was definitely uh, a, a very important member in the Ascala movement, teaching in, in these special schools that the Russian government had established at that, at that time for, uh, for Jews, for trying to um, create this new type of modern educated Jew in modern Russia. He also uh, wrote, um, articles for Jewish newspapers in Hebrew and in Russian. But uh, mainly he was well known for his uh, poems. Some of them he wrote before the poem we, we are going to re read and focus on today. Some he wrote later, but uh, in, in a general um, uh, evaluation of his work, Yalag in his very powerful poems called for deep changes in the world of uh, halakha, he wanted to see a deep change in the Jewish economical system, trying to make Jews a um, productive, productive part of Russian society. Um, he wanted to, to promote, like many other masculine of his times, uh, changes in Jewish education. And in fact, 
In the history of feminism, he also plays a very important role because he was one of the first Jewish writers and poets who ever expressed a very strong need for changes, maybe even radical changes in the status, the situation of, uh, of, of Jewish women. For all of these uh, um, approaches and ideas, Yalag was uh, deeply hated in different uh, circles of the ultra-Orthodox uh, communities. And in fact, in 1879, quite an old man by then, he was arrested and put in jail for, for a few weeks after a group of Hasidim reported to the Russian government officials that he was taking part in, in some uh, radical uh, revolutionary movement at the time. So, and that uh, was a very difficult and heartbreaking experience for Yalag and in fact, it, uh, it killed him uh, quite a short while later. In any case, going back uh, about 20 years, Yalag was one of those um, East European or Russian Jewish maskilim who was very enthusiastic about the reforms led by the Tsar, uh, Alexander II. And looking at, the, at this poem, um, Hakitza Ami, uh, Awaken My People, this is really one of the most important poems, or maybe it's fair to say the most important Hebrew poem that refers to um, this um, historical breakthrough brought by this uh, Russian Tsar. So let me share with you the poem over here. Um, I will uh, read it out loud in Hebrew, and you can um, follow the English, English uh, translation uh, by um, uh, Hillel Halkin. So, Hakitza uh, Ami, Wake My People, uh, written in 1863, uh, reflecting um, this very strong understanding of Russian Jewish masculine that they are living in a, a historical moment, a, a moment of revolution, of change, um, with these great reforms in, uh, in the Russian regime. So let me read this out in Hebrew. I'll try and read it uh, um, uh, slowly and clearly as possible. And then we can say a few, um, a few things about this uh, very important piece of work. Hakitza Ami. עד מתי תשענה? הן גז הליל, השמש העירה. הקיצה, שא עיניך ענה ואנה, וזמנך ומקומך אנה הקירה. הארץ בה אתה נחיה ניוולד, לגלילות אירופה הלא נחשבה. אירופה הקטנה מחלקי חלד, ובחקרי חוכמה מכולם נשגבה. ארץ עדן זאת, הן לך תיפתח. בניה אחינו לך יקראון אתה. עד מתי תהיה קרבם כאורח? למה, למה מנגד להם תלך אתה? וכבר גם יסירו שכמך מסבל, ומעל צווארך ולך ירימו. ימחו מליבם שנאת שווא והבל. יתנו לך ידם, לך שלום ישימו. הרימה נא ראשך, הישר גביך, ובעיני אהבה אלינו השגיחה. ותנה לך חוכמה ודעת ליבך, והיה עם משכיל, ובלשונם שיחה. כל בעלי בינה, בך חוכמה ילמדו, פועלים ואומנים כל מעשה חרושת, אמיצי הלב בצבא יעבודו, איכרים יקנו שדות ומחרשת. אל אוצר המדינה הווה חיליך, ובנכסיה קח חלק וזבד, היה אדם בצאתך, ויהודי באוהליך, אך לבני ארצך, ולמלכך עבד. הקיצה עמי, עד מתי תשענה? הן גז הליל, השמש שאירה. הקיצה, שא עיניך ענה ואנה, וזמנך 
ומקומך אנא הכירה. So um, there's much, many things to say about uh, this very powerful poem. First thing we have to mention that there's a very important sentence about being a Adam betzetecha and a Yehudi be'oalecha, a man when you um, are outside and a Jew when you are inside. Many uh, students I have at least, um, Israeli students, um, have this uh, vague concept that the sentence was uh, phrased by Moshe Mendelssohn uh, in part of the German uh, movement of Ascala in the 18th century. But this uh, line, very famous line, comes from the poetry, from this poem of Yalag, and in many ways was the most uh, famous sentence in the whole history of, uh, of the Haskalah movement. So in general, of course, this... Um, okay, I'll do, I'll do that, I'll leave the poem so you can see it, sorry about that. Um, so if we have the poem in front of us, let me mention a few anecdotes. Um, and then we can uh, go a, li a little deep into it. So Yalag is explaining to his listeners that Europe is a small part of the world, but at this time holds most of the wisdom of the world. And that, and that means one should be uh, proud of being part of Europe and happy that Russia is going through all these reforms that are going to turn her to part, a legitimate part of Europe, of course, uh, Western Europe, Central Europe. He calls the uh, land of, of uh, Russia, a land of Eden, um, seeing um, all Russian citizens as the brother, brothers to Jews and that the Jews have to see themselves too as their brothers. They all days of, um, of um, of existing a part of society are over. Hatred will now be removed. The Russians, are, Russian government, Russian regime, Russian czar, Russian people are calling for shalom, for peace, and, the, and Jews have to respond uh, to that with their, uh, their own calling for shalom. And over here, very powerful um, sentences. Um, you have to keep your head up high stand tall, um, become an educated um, individual, educa educated society, and very important, speak the language of the nation, learn Russian, learn how to use it uh, in, in daily life, in the field of literature, poetry, be part of the Russian culture. And sentences that um, might uh, sound re relevant even today, um, one, Yalag calls Jews in everywhere they are, whoever wants to listen to him, uh, learn crafts and trades, be prepared to join the army, become farmers, pay your taxes, um, feel a complete part of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, new, new Russia that's been created in our times in these uh, years of the 1860s. So um, I want to make two um, major comments about uh, the song. I'll be very happy, happy to hear um, your remarks about it. Every time I read it uh, out loud, um, I get new insights from uh, new listeners. Um, but, but the first point I want to emphasize over here is um, the use Yalag make the the use of uh, metaphors Yalag is a uh, is doing over here. Okay, so I want to refer refer to three metaphors: the metaphor of awakening, okay, wake my people, sleep no more; the metaphor of light, a uh, night is over, day has come, the sun shines. And this metaphor of straight, standing up straight, rise your head high, stand tall. 
So all three, awakening, light, and standing up straight, are very topical for the spirit of enlightenment, not only in Jewish circles, but in uh, the entire European, European movement of enlightenment in Germany, France, England, and even in, uh, in, the, in the United States. Um, this is a very deep call of, for change, changing the way one looks at himself, one look, experiences life. Um, this whole metaphor of um, light is actually, and obviously part of the word enlightenment, so it's really um, putting aside a complete um, understanding, uh, understanding of life as it existed until, until the Enlightenment movement came to be and looking at the world in a complete different way. And beneath that or underneath that, you can really see what Yalag, the poet, thinks about Jewish life before Enlightenment comes. So obviously, if it has to be awakened, that means it, it is or was asleep. Um, if it uh, has to see the light, it was obviously an experience of darkness everywhere. And if one has to um, rise his head up high and stand tall, that obviously means that before he was bent down and crooked. Okay, so over here we can really see a poet with, with a very negative estimation or evaluation of uh, Jewish life as he grew up into it and as he knew it. He sees it as a very bad experience, that there's something very problematic, maybe even uh, broken, completely broken in Jew Jewish life, and thus has to be mended, it has to be fixed. Now we will see, and you, we, you probably know this, that uh, these high expectations of the Ascala movement were, had something very naive in them, but nonetheless, thus deep of an understanding that there's something wrong with Jewish existence and it has to be repaired, fixed, revolutionized. This was part of modern Jewish culture, modern Jewish political culture that went on into the 20th century long after the Ascala movement didn't exist anymore. So that, this was basically the legacy of Ascala uh, and maybe even Yalag's legacy for modern Jewish thought and modern Jewish action long after his times. So that's one thing that uh, has to be said. Uh, I want to make, make another remark and over here looking at um, this uh, historical moment in maybe even a wider uh, perspective. Um, I want to explain over here that this, these ideas of Ascala, this ideology we see over here um, is really a serious and deep revolution in Jewish history. So let me explain this. We have learned from the great um, historian Yaakov Katz, um, that uh, Jewish uh, existence in diaspora um, for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, was based on four major elements. And let me, um, let me lay them down in front of you. So the first element that really is a characteristic of Jewish existence among the nations, call it exile, gola, or diaspora, in any case, um, the first basic idea is that there is a deep and well-felt um, difference, differentiation in between Israel and the Amin, between Israel and other people. And if you want, call them the Goyim. Okay, there's something in, in Jewish religion and Jewish sense of nationality Jewish time, Jewish uh, intimate language. There's something that um, that's, brings Jews and Gentiles completely apart. They love together, they can know each other, they can be friendly neighbors, many for uh, long periods of time, but the Jewish community know, knows that it, it is a part of a people that lives apart. Okay, that's one uh, very clear um, 
dimension of Jewish existence. The second um, dimension Yaakov Katz um, describes is the existence of Jewish autonomy. Very um, common in uh, Europe for hundreds of years from early uh, days in, in uh, the Middle Ages, in the communities of Jews in France, in Ashkenaz, and then for hundreds of years of uh, the experience of Jews in Lithuania, Poland, and other places, the fact that Jewish community was, uh, an, in, was a separate political autonomy, a Jewish corporation in the sense of a, of a, a private body that has many um, relationships, obviously, with uh, the local government, local business, et cetera, et cetera, but it runs its uh, life, its inside life by its own, with its own institutions. And from that perspective, a very important outcome of this existence is the fact that the individual Jew, one person has no rights standing by himself. There is no such a thing until modern times as civil rights as we know them today for, individual, for the individual. The Jewish individual is completely understood and defined by, um, by the local government, government wh whoever it is, uh, he's defined by his uh, belonging uh, to this Jewish autonomy, to the Jewish corporation. The third element, element uh, that uh, really is characteristic of Jewish existence is the fact that Jews saw the, this autonomous uh, community as a holy community, what we call in Hebrew a kehilat kodesh, kodesh meaning that basically every um, dimension of political, educational, and social life are part of acts that belong to the sphere of holiness. As if to say that the, the actual existence of a Jewish community is part of the relationship between Jews and their religious commitments, Jews and God, Jews and their ancient history, Jews and their, their hopes for the future, for Biata Mashiach, in any case, this is a existence that um, is completely um, full, full with this uh, concept of holiness. The fourth element is the fact that law, custom, knowledge are all based on old ways, old traditions, old mindsets. As if to say, every modern idea, every new idea that we encounter, uh, we look at it in a very, this is of course in the traditional society, we look at it very carefully before adopting it. And the main authority upon the ways of life, again, of the individual, the family, the group, the community is based on the old ideas traditional ideas. Okay, so let me mention these four um, basic um, characteristics again. Um, a deep feeling of difference between Jews and non-Jews, Yisrael the Ha'amim, a existence of a Jewish autonomy, a deep understanding that the life of this autonomy, this Jewish community has something holy about it, a kehilat kodesh, and the authority of old knowledge upon life, and great suspicion towards modern new knowledge. So if we follow this, these ideas of Yaakov Katz, which I find very powerful, we can easily see that in Yalad's poem over here, all four concepts are under a complete attack. Because instead of looking at, at Jewish existence as uh, standing with a very tall fence or wall um, separating us from um, the Gentile neighbors, obviously Yalag is calling for a com complete new relationship 
between Israel and the Amim, between Israel and the nations. He wants the Jews to see the Russian people as their brothers in any sense, any way. He's definitely calling for the breaking of Jewish autonomy. He wants to see as many other masculines at, uh, of that time, he wants, he wants to see Jews as part of the Russian state. And he also wants the individual, the individual Jew to be able to love in this uh, new framework as an individual. He does not have to depend or be defined by the community that surrounds him. Um, Yalag is an extremely a secular poet, so there's no doubt he does not uh, understand Jewish existence in the family, in the community, as something holy. On the contrary, he's very happy to have a, a secular um, uh, powers, concepts uh, enter Jewish life. And of course, and this is very typical for um, the Scala movement and for modernity in general, he is delighted with um, uh, new ways of thought, with um, breaking traditional uh, concepts and mindsets. And uh, he actually sees himself as a person who brings awakening, light, um, which come from uh, modern ideas, new ideas that are trying to overcome uh, all Jewish concepts. So from all this, we can see very clearly that um, this poem in, uh, in particular and the entire uh, Haskalah movement in general um, are really a radical revolution in Jewish life, Jewish existence in the way it was practiced practiced for um, hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, what happened uh, next will lead us to uh, one more very famous poem of uh, Yalag. Um, let me describe the historical context really in a nutshell for a few moments and then we'll uh, look at this uh, poem. Also very like a uh, I identify a few phrases over here, are very powerful and well known and very identified with the, with the poet himself. So actually during the 1860s and the 1870s, um, there was a, a whole generation of young Jews in Russia, young men, young women who followed Yalag's call. They wanted to go uh, down that uh, path, wanted to integrate into Russian society, learn the language, become productive, um, receive a modern Russian education, take part in governmental systems, in the world of business and, um, and manufacturing. And, um, and many, many of them uh, became completely secular and actually created this new kind of elite, of uh, a Russian jury, speaking Russian, uh, living a completely secular life, um, feeling much more part of Russian society and culture than part of a Jewish society and culture. So look, only eight years after Yalag wrote uh, Hakitsa Ami, Awaken My People, um, the, we can see a radical um, movement amongst uh, young Jewish um, Russians. And Yalag now writes another poem, but in a completely um, different um, attitude toward what's going on. So again, let me please read the Hebrew and you can, you can follow me um, with the English trans translation again by Hillel Halkin. We won't read the whole poem, but um, the most famous uh, stanzas from it. So Yalag wrote like this, writes like this, Od bat hashira elai mitganevet. Od libi hoge veyemini kotevet. Kotevet shirim 
ובשפה נשכחת. מה אישי, מה חפצי ומגמת פניי, ולמי אני עמל? מבחר כל שניי, ומחסר נפשי מטובה ונחת. אוקיי? Okay, for whom do I toil? למי אני עמל? Very famous uh, words by Yalag. What is he talking about? Let's see in the next stanza. ובנינו, הדור הבא אחרינו, הם מנעוריהם יתנכרו אלינו. למו פצעי ליבי ידבו יעזובו? הינם הולכים קדימה שנה שנה. מי ידע הגבול עד מתי? עד אנה? אולי עד מקום משם לא ישובו. ולמי איפה אעמול אני הגבר? למתי מספר השרידים מבני עבר שעוד לא נתנו שיר ציון לשנינה? הוי שיבולים בודדות, מי ידע איימו? מי יישא ראשם הנה מספר למו? אחד בעירם ושניים במדינה. So what we see over here, and this is very interesting to compare maybe to processes Jewish life is going in other places today. Yalag was promoting a revolution in Jewish life and looking for a deep integration with the Russian society and culture. But nonetheless, he did write his uh, poetry his most powerful poetry in Hebrew. And this is because the Ascala movement from the days of Mendelssohn in the 18th century and for many, many decades had a very uh, deep uh, appreciation and admiration for Hebrew. They saw it as the, obviously the language of the Bible, of the Tanakh, with all the great ideas that uh, that uh, derived from it, and they saw a very important um, dimension of knowing Hebrew, the Hebrew of the Mishnah, of the Midrash, medieval Hebrew, as part of a um, national self-understanding, self-identity, and self-culture. So for Yalag and many, many other great writers of Askala, writing in Hebrew was part of their worldview. However, in this poem over here, we can see the poet maybe starting to regret the movement he himself tried to create, because what he describes over here is that in a, in a deep sense, his um, enterprise was in vain. He sees around him, and he over here is already quite an old person. Most of his career is behind him as a writer, as an educator. He, can, he feels over here, and he, it's not only a feeling, but a deep understanding that there is now a whole new generation of young Jews, men and women, in the beginning of their lives, who followed his call, but have abandoned completely any kind of Jewish identity whatsoever. And the most powerful sign for this is the loss of language. The, the complete ignorance in Hebrew. They can't speak it, they don't understand it, and even worse, they don't have anything, nothing to do with it. They're not interested in it. So now he, see, he thinks to himself, Lemi ani amel, what's the point of the entire thing if even what I was hoping for, a man outside, Adam betzetecha, but still a Yehudi be'olecha if that doesn't exist anymore. So over here we can see in a very short time from 1863 until 1871, quite a change in, the, in Yalag's um, understanding of the historical situation, his an analysis of it, and uh, a, a, a sense of crisis that is, um, developing through this, um, through this uh, idea of uh, integrating into Russian society. Of course, this wasn't um, the, the last episode of uh, 
of, uh, of uh, affairs. Um, soon enough, deep changes um, happened in the Russian Empire and changed completely um, the vision of Ascala, changed, changed uh, Yalag's understanding of things, and basically it changed uh, Jewish uh, history uh, entirely. So uh, what happened exactly in the early 1880s and how that affected um, Jewish life and what happened later that we will um, see and find out uh, next week. Thank you, Asael. Um, I was actually going to ask you to hint about next week and you did it all on your own. Um, if anyone has questions, this is the time. Um, there is one question that came up, which is actually relevant to what you just spoke about. So maybe um, you'd like to answer this a moment. Where is it? I lost it. Um, the question is, who could read Hebrew and such poetry at the time this was written? You mentioned now the loss of Hebrew, so who was really the audience of these poems? Okay, that's a very good question. So let me say um, something very, very general about um, Jewish languages at the time. So this is very important to keep in mind. I said this, but one has to take note that the Haskalah movement was very small. Uh, it had a very deep effect. Some of the books of Haskalah were best sellers and uh, changed lives for young men and women during the late 19th century, but still most of the Jews in the Russian empire um, um, spoke Yiddish. They lived in the Pale of Settlement, in the small villages, the Shtetel, Shtetelach, and hardly didn't they, most of them didn't know Russian at all. Uh, definitely couldn't write and couldn't write and read in Russian. And men knew Hebrew, um, mainly for religious re reasons. Women, most of them even couldn't speak Hebrew properly and maybe not even uh, read Hebrew. So it's true that Yalag is writing over here for a elite who is well-educated, that received at least a um, religious education and now you can actually in, imagine this individual uh, growing up in a town like Odessa or Vilna or Berdichev, or maybe even in a small village, he received a fine religious Hebrew education, but now because times are changing and we are in the middle of the 19th century, he's looking for a new way in life. He maybe has, um, a deeper, a strong will to become a secular person. So he is the perfect client for Yalag's calling. He will be part of this new uh, revolutionary generation. So I, I'm saying this again, Yalag is part of a, an elite. Um, when he describes this whole generation that's uh, going, that's getting lost because it doesn't speak Hebrew anymore, He's referring to a few thousands of people, not millions. Many millions of Jews were not part of this um, process at all. They were still like locked in the religious old ways in the state and speaking mainly Yiddish. But it is true that as time went by and we moved from the 1860s and 1870s, 20, 30, and then 50 years forward, what we will do next week, you can see that this generation will expand in a very, becoming like really close to being millions already. This will be a very uh, dramatic uh, process and with a very deep um, effect on uh, Jewish existence over there in, in, in East Europe. Okay. Uh, Robert wants to know if there's a relationship between Golden and early religious Zionism, like Rav al Kalai. Or... Okay, so that really is um, the subject of uh, the lecture next week. We will see how the uh, vision of Yalag uh, met a complete crisis in 1881, 
after the assassination of uh, Alexander II and the great pogroms against the Jews that occurred, um, then we start uh, seeing a national movement replacing this naive dream of Ascala. And then we'll see that Yalag as an individual, a very old person at that time, he had to um, um, explain what he thinks about things. So, I'll, but I'll give you the answer, I'll answer Robert. Yalag thought that the best thing Jews could do at that time after the crisis of 1881 was um, uh, migrate to America. He was very skeptical about um, what we now call Zionism. Okay, so for him, that was the best way to go. And as you very well know, millions of Jews uh, held the same uh, understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. Um, Esther Lapian wants to know if the Russian people were open to accepting the Jews Yelag was encouraging. Uh, not at all. And that's part of the great tragedy of Ascala. We can even uh, judge it um, uh, in a very negative way today, but um, they had a dream. And the dream was if we Jews fix ourselves become educated, become productive, stand up straight, that will be enough to be accepted um, by the society that surrounds us. Now this what turned out to be extremely naive. Hardly anyone in Russian government, the Russian intellectual world, not to say just uh, um, any Russian on the street or in the, in a, of a city or in a village, they hardly had anything to do with this idea. So this was, and this actually brings together the fate of West European and Central European Jewry at the same time and the Haskalah movement in East Europe in Russia. They both had a very naive approach or, 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 or a way to solve the Jewish, Jewish question by the time the 19th century was over, it turned out to be a com complete failure because there was really no uh, will from the other side to accept the Jews as they were hoping to be accept accepted. We see. Here's a question I'm sure you'll have much to say about. As far back as Isra, Jews complained that the children are not speaking Hebrew. Why do you think that a Jewish language is so important in transmitting culture and that trans translation doesn't work? Okay, that's a huge topic, maybe yeah. even a, a, a topic. We hope of, to have a series on that topic, right? Right, so let me try and answer in a, like a very general way. I'll put it like this. The history, history of Hebrew begins with Tanakh and the fact that Hebrew still exists today is something that we have to pay attention to because the fact is that during his Jewish history, Jews always adopted in a very deep way the, the languages that surrounded them. That's true uh, with Aramit, Aramaic, which is already inside the Tanakh and definitely played a, a very powerful role in Jewish culture for, for generations from the days of the Second Temple until the Talmud Bavli, which is in Aramaic, and the book of Zohar, which is in Aramaic. So Aramit, a very powerful language, living inside Jewish existence, Jewish culture. We have a very powerful encounter between Jew Jewish, Jewish life and Greek during the days of the Second Temple in Eretz Israel, in Egypt, in other places. We have an extremely powerful meeting between Jew Jewish life and Arabic. Okay, you take note that in the middle of the Middle Ages, the most important Jewish books in philosophy were written in, in Arabic. More Nevochim, Chovot al Vavot, Emunot Vedeot. Even the book of uh, Rabbi Uda Levi, Akuzari, which is full of love for Hebrew, was written in Arabic. So 
definitely Jews always used the languages that surrounded them and Hebrew always existed in all kinds of ways. It had sometimes a renaissance in Italy, in France, in the days of Rashi, in the golden age in Spain, etc., etc. But for many, many uh, parts of Jewish history, Hebrew was almost extinct. Now, let me say, I'll just take one more minute, Tamar, is that okay? Sure, yeah. Okay, so in modern times, we can see that different modern Jewish ideologies had a lot to say about languages. For instance, the Haskalah movement hated Yiddish, believed that Jews had to learn a European languages, language or languages, German, French, uh, French, Russian, if, if it was in Russia, and some of them had uh, admiration, as I said, to, for Hebrew as a national, um, a part of a national identity. But this wasn't always the case. For instance, for instance the reform movement beginning in um, Germany in the early 19th century and then moving to America uh, was completely against Yiddish, didn't ye use Hebrew at all, and was completely focused on German as the right uh, aesthetic and um, delicate uh, language Jews should use. You maybe know, some of you maybe know this more than me, but it's well documented that in the late 19th century, in the great cities of America, Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Louis, great uh, Jewish reform communities. If you had a kid over there who was already born in the United States, his parents immigrated, he was born there, completely surrounded by a English speaking environment, he was, he was forced to give his bar mitzvah drasha in German because this was considered Lashona Kodesh in a reform community. And of course, Zionism had to say something about Yiddish and about Hebrew and Jewish socialism had, was very proud of Yiddish and hated Hebrew. So you can see in modern times, different modern ideologies in, in the Jewish context are using languages, Yiddish, Hebrew, European languages as real, um, as tools to define themselves and their, their ideology. So as, as far as Ascala is concerned, Hebrew was a very important part of creating or keeping alive a national cultural identity. But for instance, for Jewish socialism, this wasn't important at all. In fact, they identified Hebrew as the bourgeois language that had to be completely, um, stop, stop use it completely and use only Yiddish, the language of the working Jewish class. So it's, it's a very complicated um, picture that actually reflects in a very deep way the complications of Jewish existence of that time. I think I'm gonna take one last question. Uh, Leon Kess is asking, what non-Jewish books or authors influenced Golden? Uh, okay, so I, I'm speechless now because uh, Leon Cass is a person I love very, very much. So I'm now, <laughs> if you allow me, Tamar, I'm, I'm, I have to send him a kiss. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Sure. And, te and tell him um, I'm nothing very much. Um, okay, so now please, uh, Please uh, repeat the question. Repeat the question, no problem. So Leon wants to know what non-Jewish books or authors influenced Goldwyn? Um, I think, I, I, do, I don't know the answer um, in depth, but um, without go, I'll have to check this and write to Leon, Leon in person. But it is true okay. that, um, uh, we are, if we are in the middle of the 19th century in Russia, that means that um, what the, these winds of change and world of uh, reform, this is also the beginning of the golden age of a Russian modern literature. Pushkin, Gogol, Dentolstoy, Dostoevsky, 
etc., 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 Gorky. And so um, without knowing this for sure, uh, I assume, and I'll check this, that uh, Gordon himself had already um, read these, uh, these uh, most important uh, Russian novels of the time, and, and some of them are dealing with these great changes Russian life is going through. But again, I have to look this up uh, much carefully. Okay, so the f we, we couldn't take all the questions. I'm sorry, I know that this topic is starting up a lot of interest, but maybe some of the things that people are asking will also get answered in the following sessions. Thank you very much, Mr. El. Thank you everybody for joining us. And we'll continue next week with poetry and Zionism. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>